Here we go. Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. Today we have a special guest, Frank. What's up, guys? He lives in the same city as me, San Jose, California. And what we're going to do for Frank today is we're going to do his upper ball joints. Now, why would you want to do your upper ball joints? Number one, you've diagnosed that there is excessive play in the joint and you're worried about them failing and causing a catastrophic failure. Or maybe the boot has ripped and you didn't take care of it right away and now it's gotten a lot of grit in there and excessive wear and you want to replace them. Another reason why you might be doing it is maybe just because you're tearing apart your front end of your vehicle, you're up updating things like the lower ball joints which have been known to fail. Maybe you're updating some suspension components like new coilovers. Maybe you're doing some lower control arm bushings or upper control arm bushings. For whatever reason, you're deciding you want to replace the upper ball joints at the same time. We're going to show you how to get that done. We sort of showed how to do this job when we did the Toy Tech Boss Lift that we did for this guy Eric. We had to remove the upper ball joint so we can put in the special adapter that would go with his Total Chaos upper control arms. But the way we did it is we kept the knuckles on the vehicle and I found that it was pretty awkward. So since then I put a Sonoran Steel lift on my 98 Forerunner and I just decided to take the knuckle completely off the vehicle, put it in my bench vise and then did all the pressing of the ball joint out and back in on the bench vise which is a lot easier to do because you're not fighting holding the knuckle still while you're trying to press the ball joint out and back in but it does take a little bit of extra labor to get the knuckle off you've got to take the brake caliper off depending on how you do it disconnect the lower ball joint four bolts or you disconnect the connection of the lower ball joint and the tie rod there's different ways to do it. You've got to take a brake bracket off. You've got to take your ABS sensor off. So we're going to run through all that. It is a little bit of additional labor, but this is the way I'm going to show you. And it is the way the factory service manual shows you how to do it. They recommend removing the knuckle completely off the vehicle. Let's start off by showing you the parts, and then we'll show you some pages out of the factory service manual we're going to use for this job. All right, so here's the ball joint in its package. This is the part number, and it's the same part number for both sides. They're not side specific. And then when you open up the package, here's what you get. You get your ball joint without the boot on. You've got the boot. You've got the wire that attaches the boot to the upper ball joint. You have a packet of grease. And then you have a new C-clip that secures the ball joint to the knuckle. The pages we're gonna use in the factory service manual are in the suspension and axle section. It says, remove the steering knuckle with axle hub, and it refers you to a page in the factory service manual to learn how to do that. And then it says, remove the upper ball joint by removing the wire and boot, removing the snap ring, and then you just press it out. The instructions starts off by saying, removing the front wheel, and then it says, removing the shock absorber. You don't need to remove the shock absorber to get the knuckle off. Then it talks about removing the CV axle and you gotta remove that big 35 millimeter nut. And then you gotta take off the ABS sensor from the knuckle. You gotta remove the brake line bracket. And then you gotta remove the front brake caliper off the rotor and then get the rotor out of your way too. It talks about disconnecting the four lower ball joint bolts, but instead of doing that, I'm just gonna disconnect the lower ball joint from the lower control arm and I'm gonna disconnect the outer tie rod from the knuckle of the ball joint. That's just personal preference. I just found that instead of trying to align the four bolts for the ball joint, it's a little bit easier just to slide the ball joint back into the lower control arm and then reattach the outer tie rod. So that's gonna be my technique. So that's all the pages out of the factory service manual we're gonna need for this job. In regards to how you can test the ball joint to see if it has play in it, Here's one way you can do it. With the tire still on the vehicle, you can get a big long pry bar for some extra leverage. You get the tip of the pry bar under the upper control arm and you can pull up just like this. What you're looking for is independent movement in this joint. If there's no play in the joint, the upper control arm and the knuckle and the ball joint all should move as one unit. If you saw excessive movement in this area, like the joint popping, that means that the ball and socket has worn and it could potentially fail on you. So that's what you're looking for. Another thing you're looking for, is there any excessive grease that has squirted out to let you know that, hey, my boot is torn. I do think they make boots that you can buy 
alone without the ball joint, but I'm not 100% sure. So if there is one and I find it, I'll put that in the video description for you. Maybe you just need to renew the boot. So you disconnect the upper control arm from the ball joint. You slip over a new boot with a new piece of wire and then you call it good. So we currently have the front end of the vehicle jacked up. We have the frame supported on both sides with six ton jack stands. And we have the hydraulic jack underneath the cross member, underneath the front differential, just as a backup. Looking at this upper ball joint, you can see some grease has squirted out, but it's not 100% easy to see if the boot is torn. You'd have to wipe it away, and it looks like it might be still intact, maybe just a little bit squeezed out over time. But once we get this off the knuckle, then we can examine it a little bit better. With it compressed like this, it's gonna be a little bit hard to tell if the boot is actually ripped. So the first thing that I'm gonna take off the knuckle is the ABS sensor. It's held on with a 10 millimeter bolt. Now these sensors can sometimes be a little bit hard to get out. They have a rubber O-ring that makes it basically a moisture barrier so no water can get into the knuckle and cause rust. So just pull back a little bit and that came out really easily. But if you found that you were having a hard time getting this out, you might just have to grab onto this gently with a pair of pliers or something, maybe with a rag between it and just twist and pull back and you should be able to get it out. The O-ring I was talking about is right here which can make it a little sticky to pull it out of the knuckle. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna free this clip that holds the ABS sensor to this brake line bracket. The reason why is ultimately I'm gonna take this bracket off the knuckle and we're gonna take the caliper off and swing it up and hang it with some bailing wire out of the way so we can get the knuckle off. So I'm just gonna get this little clip free. I'm using a needle nose pliers I'm just gonna compress it and then push it out the back side. You could use a screwdriver too, it just has two tabs and now that's free. So now you can see that it's almost free of the knuckle. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna disconnect this bracket up here that holds the ABS sensor to the top of the knuckle. Again, this is a 10 millimeter bolt, so I'm gonna use my Milwaukee and zip this out. All you gotta do with this clamp is just Get in here with the screwdriver to get in there with your hands. It's not a very strong clamp. You could pull it, spread it out a little bit, and then slip it off the knuckle. So now this whole ABS sensor wire is free of the knuckle. The next thing I'm gonna disconnect is this brake line bracket off the knuckle. It's a 12 millimeter bolt. I'm gonna first break this free with my gear wrench 3 8 ratchet. Now that's loose and I'm gonna zip it out the rest of the way with my Milwaukee. The Milwaukee is a very handy tool, but it doesn't have very good braking free force, so that's why I generally, if something's a little bit hard to get off, I'll break it free first with a regular ratchet. All right, now that brake line is free. A good technique so you don't misplace fasteners and forget where they went, I'm just gonna screw this right back into the knuckle so I don't forget where it went or I lose it somewhere. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the brake caliper off. It's held on to the knuckle with two 17 millimeter bolts. I'm using a deep 17 millimeter impact socket and then my big flex head gear wrench half inch drive ratchet. And just loosen those suckers up. The deep 17 millimeter might hinder you from backing it out all the way, so I'm transitioning now to a short 17 millimeter because basically as I back the bolt out, I'm gonna be right up against the lower control arm and then I won't be able to get the socket off the head of the nut. After you give it a few turns, you'll most likely be able just to get the socket on there with your hand and get it out the rest of the way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take the bottom bolt out for now. I'm gonna leave the upper bolt in for right now. You have to do something with this caliper and you don't want it to be pulling tension on the brake line. You can end up bending this line and cause damage to the rubber line. What we're gonna do is we're gonna get some baling wire and you basically figure out a place where you can get baling wire or maybe a bungee cord and where you can lift the caliper off and support it somehow to where it's not pulling tension on the brake line. So I have a piece of baling wire running through this part of the frame. Now I'm gonna get the last bolt off, pivot it over here, and it's nice if you have an extra person to help you, they can hold it steady while you get the baling wire tight enough to where it's not pulling tension on the line. 
So now I can pull this free and then I'm gonna affix the baling wire. It can take a little effort. Another thing we could have done is we could have attached it up higher, maybe up on this part of the upper control arm mount on the frame. However it works, just make sure that when you're done, that there's not any tension on the brake line to where you're gonna damage it or you're gonna bend this metal brake line. The next thing we're gonna take off is the rotor because it's kind of heavy and when we carry this over to the workbench, it's gonna be nice to not have this extra weight. Now, most of you are gonna find that you just can't pull this off with your hand, so what do you do? A little bit of manipulation with a rubber mallet or a dead blow hammer is what you need to do. You hit it a couple times and hopefully it'll break free. What ends up happening, you get a little corrosion underneath the face of this rotor and it just kind of gets stuck on there. So we're gonna give it some persuasion. Like so. Now it's off. And if you've ever lifted one of these up, it's kind of heavy, so it's kind of good to get it out of your way. And this is what I was talking about. It gets kind of corroded and hooked onto the face here. So when we reassemble this, what I'm gonna do for Frank is clean it up a little bit and I'm gonna put a little bit of anti-seize on the face of this so it'll be less likely to get really stuck on there in the future. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get this dust cover off. What I have is this slim blade tool that I'm gonna get in between the cap and the face of this hub and break it free a little bit. If you didn't have a little skinny wedge like this, you can use a skinny screwdriver just to get it started a little bit. And then once it's started a little bit, I'm gonna progress up to basically a medium sized cold chisel. And then I'm gonna work around and get it further away. Finally, I'm gonna use even a bigger cold chisel to get it further out. And then we're gonna pop it loose with a small pry bar. Now here's something to note. You see this BS right here? This is someone that didn't know what the hell they were doing. They damaged his cap because they didn't have the right succession of tools. They used some brute force and they bent the crap out of it. You don't need to do this in order to get this thing off. If you do what I said with the progression of tools like this, you can get this thing off clean. So I can tell that they manhandled this thing and damaged it when they didn't have to. Okay, I've gotten a small gap around the whole circumference of the cap. Now I'm gonna to transition to the cold chisel. And finally, we're gonna use the bigger one. Okay, I have a nice gap. It's probably about 3 8 of an inch now. And then now I'm just gonna grab a smaller size pry bar. You could maybe use a big screwdriver if you don't have one of these. And then I'm gonna get it in between and I'm just gonna pop the top of the handle and pop it free. And there we go, the cap is off. The next thing we gotta do is we gotta get this cotter pin out first so we can get this 35 millimeter axle nut off. So you just, Grab a pair of needle nose pliers, whatever you got, straighten it out, and then pull it out. Even if you get the cotter pin kind of straight, you're probably gonna find it's gonna fight you a little bit. Grab a big pair of dikes or maybe just a regular pair of pliers. You can grab the head and then lever it out against the nut here. There we go. And that's how you can get it off. It's a little bit stuck in there we got to get this axle nut off. It's a big nut, it's 35 millimeters. A lot of people aren't gonna have this, so you'd have to buy this either at a store that actually carries it, or more likely online. The easiest way is if you have a impact gun, I can zip this off no problem. If you didn't have an impact gun, here's what you can do. You would keep the brakes connected, so you would get this off before you took the brakes off. You get a buddy, they get inside, they apply the brakes, you get on here with your 35 millimeter socket and a big breaker bar and you use your man strength and you break it free. Another thing you can do if you're by yourself is you put the tire back on, you lower the vehicle to the ground and then the tire is gonna create that resistance to where you can break this free. So those are two additional options if you don't have an impact gun. But since I have an impact gun, I'm gonna use it. The factory service manual suggests disconnecting the four lower ball joint bolts that attach the lower ball joint to the knuckle 
There's two here and two on the back side. But instead, I'm gonna just break free this castle nut and use a puller and break the ball joint free of the lower control arm. And then on the back side, I'm gonna break free the outer tie rod from the knuckle of the ball joint. And then the last thing that will be holding this knuckle to the vehicle is the upper ball joint. The first thing I gotta do is straighten out the cotter pin and get the cotter pin out of the way of the lower ball joint. Same thing, just use the needle nose pliers, straighten it out as best you can, and then see if you can get it out really easily. I got it out a little bit, and I'm gonna use the same technique with a pair of dikes and lever it out. Like so. Now I'm gonna zip off this castle nut with my impact gun, it's a 24 millimeter. Now I'm gonna get the puller in place. And the key with using pullers is you don't wanna damage the boot of the ball joint. So you gotta be careful and get the tines of the puller in between the boot and the lower control arm. Especially since Frank told me these are newer lower ball joints and I don't wanna mess them up. I verified that I'm not capturing the boot and then now I just have to tighten this rod against the spindle of the lower ball joint and it will break free. Pullers will basically work every time unless the puller fails, but nothing has failed on me yet. So choose your method. If you like the big effing hammer, go ahead and do that. All right. And this could break free with a little bit of force, so don't get scared and wet your pants. There you go, just like that. If you recently replaced your lower ball joints, you'll find that it'll break free easy. If these are original ball joints, then it's gonna take a lot more force to break it free. Now we're gonna get the outer tie rod disconnected from the knuckle of the ball joint. Same thing, straighten out the cotter pin, get it off, and get the castle nut off. And this is a 19 millimeter. What we just found with Frank's truck is this castle nut is actually a 21 which isn't the norm these are aftermarket outer tie rods and i guess they supplied a different size castle nut it's usually a 19 millimeter now we're just going to get another puller on here and break this free so i have a different style puller to break free the outer tie rod from the knuckle of the ball joint this puller and the other puller i used to break free the ball joint they are both from a otc kit that has been very handy over the years. So I'll put a link in the video description of that OTC puller kit. So same thing, you're gonna be driving force with this rod against the spindle of the outer tie rod and it's gonna break it free. Jeez, that obviously had been changed recently too because it took pretty much no force to get off. It wasn't really locked in, so now that's free. We pretty much have everything disconnected with the exception of the upper ball joint from the upper control arm. Same thing, straighten out the cotter pin and then we're gonna zip this castle nut off. So now I'm gonna use my little mini DeWalt. Sometimes it breaks free the things I want it to break free, other times not. Let's see if it does it today. Oh, it almost didn't make it, but it made it. So now I'm gonna grab the same puller that I used to break free the outer tie rod, and I'm gonna get that on there. Same thing, drive force down, and it's gonna break it free. One thing I am gonna do is I'm gonna put this on partially, not tighten it up, to where it, when it breaks free, it's not just gonna come flopping down on me. So I'm just gonna screw it in to where it's even with the top of the spindle of the upper ball joint and leave it there just like that. So once it breaks free, it's not gonna go crashing down on me. So you get this medium size length tine puller and you hook it underneath basically the rear and the front and then screw the spindle down. As you can see, this thing obviously has never been off. And so that's why it took a lot more force to get this thing to break free. It finally moved a little bit. Now we're just gonna spin the castle nut off and it should be broken free. And there we go. Now I have to push the CV axle through the hub to where then I can lift it up off of the lower control arm. A lot of times you could just push with your hand. If not, you could use a little persuasion with a mallet. First, I'm gonna lift it up off of the 
lower ball joint, and then push back on the shaft. Be careful not to damage a seal behind here. You can let the CV shaft just hang out there. And then now you have your whole knuckle off with the lower ball joint still attached. And now we're gonna bring this over to the workbench and get this upper ball joint up. So I have the knuckle captured in my bench vise. And the first thing we have to do is we have to cut this wire off so we can pull this boot off because we have to have the boot off in order to get the ball joint press leaves in position to drive this thing out. So I'm just gonna get in with my pair of dikes and cut this off. There we go. And you can see how the wire was wrapped around like so. Then you just pry this boot off. It was torn a little bit, so I didn't do that just now. It was torn, so that's why he had a little bit of grease shown there. He was torn right at the bottom, but we couldn't see it because the boot was compressed. I'm gonna wipe this free of the excess grease here, and then I'm gonna clean this up here so I can expose the C-clip so I can see where I have to expand it to get it off. So here's the C-clip that we have to remove first before we try to drive this out of the knuckle. Use a pair of snap ring pliers and you basically have to expand it out and lift it off. <laughs> and when the snap ring goes flying at your camera, you know you succeeded. The ball joint kit that I got is from OTC. I bought some additional things to go with it. So I found out doing a little research the receiving cups and drivers that I would need in order to do this. So it took me a little research, but I have this instructions from OTC labeling all the number cups that you need to press it out and put it back in. So I will put a link in the video description to this document and I'll give you a link to this set and tell you where I bought all these additional cups. It wasn't directly from OTC, it was another supplier but maybe with just the numbers, you can do your own search and find it at a different supplier. So in this schematic, this receiving cup is this one right here. It's part number 38354. And then this upper one that's gonna drive the upper ball joint out of the knuckle, it's part number 538591. These are all OTC part numbers. And then it talks about replacing the driving nipple that goes on the end of the shaft with one that has a part number 7248. Those are the three things that I'm gonna use with the ball joint press to drive the ball joint out of the knuckle. So examining his upper ball joint, it looks like it is still in pretty good shape. It has pretty good resistance. I pull up and down on it. There's no obvious play. I think Frank could have got more miles out of this upper ball joint so I'm gonna put this driver on top and it fits right up against the face there and then I have to get the receiving cup underneath because you have to give the ball joint somewhere to go so it's gonna drop into here and then I'm gonna get my c-press in place so here's the setup you got your c-press you got the driving cup you got the receiving cup these suckers are gonna be in there a little tight so you have to use some strength to get it out. I have a pretty long half inch drive ratchet that I think will do the job. If I find I'm struggling, I'm gonna go to a longer breaker bar. Longer the lever, the more force you can apply. When I start tightening this thing, this thing might wanna swivel on me, so I'm gonna be putting pressure with my free hand and not having it turn. So if I go like this, you see it wants to turn and it might try to start swiveling out of the bench vise too. So I'm gonna put a little bit of posing pressure right here and start cranking down and I've already getting movement maybe my jaws aren't as tight as they should be and when it falls out you know you're done so here's the upper ball joint free of the knuckle now most likely you're gonna have some level of corrosion here so we're just gonna grab some fine grit sandpaper or maybe some steel wool we're gonna clean out the inner diameter of this clean this off really good to get it ready for the new ball joint so I'm just gonna use some emery cloth this is basically what you would find in the plumbing section of a hardware store to basically clean the ends of copper pipe before you solder it so I'm just gonna take this in here and just lightly get it out 
some of the slight corrosion that he has in here. Since this is a California vehicle, it's not that bad. Once it's clean enough, you're done. So now we're ready to get the new upper ball joint into the knuckle. So following the instructions from the OTC pages, I'm gonna use this adapter underneath here and it's part number 313968. And then on the top, the receiving cup to where this spindle is gonna have somewhere to go is part number 38355A as in Adam. And then you could see that you get the seat press in the same orientation and as you're driving, it's gonna push the upper ball joint into the knuckle. What I'm gonna do for Frank is I'm just gonna put a little bit of anti-seize on this inner diameter. So it's gonna be less prone to getting really locked in there from corrosion. Might make it easier for the next guy. So we have everything set up. When we're tightening down on this spindle of the ball joint press, this receiving cup can't go anywhere, right? The only thing that can move is the upper ball joint into the knuckle. So this is creating an area for the spindle of the upper ball joint to go into. And then this bottom adapter is gonna be driving it up into the knuckle. You just gotta make sure that this receiving cup is sort of centered over the hole so it won't impede the ball joint being able to press fully to where it's seated against the bottom of the knuckle. Another thing that I'm checking right now is I'm making sure that this already looks fairly square. You wouldn't want the ball joint really cocked in the hole to where it's gonna be hard to drive it in. So it looks like it has about the same amount of gap all the way around the knuckle. So I think we're ready to start driving down. There it goes. It started going a little bit crooked, but then it self-corrected. You might see that. Okay, when it gets really tight and you see that the ball joints all the way up against the bottom of the knuckle, you know you're done. Another thing you wanna check is make sure that there's an even gap for the snap ring to go in and it looks like it's perfect all the way around. Just make sure that it's driven in all the way fully and now we're gonna get our snap ring in place. So you grab your C-clip, you grab your snap ring pliers, expand it and get it onto the upper ball joint. There we go. So when it snaps in place and you look around the whole circumference and the lip of the snap ring is underneath this bottom flange, you know you're good. So now it's time to get the grease in there and get the boot on with the wire. There's actually two packs of grease and I didn't notice it when we were unpackaging the ball joints. They have a blue bag and a clear bag. The blue bag, they say to fill in the bottom folds of the boot. The clear bag, they say to put a layer that's 0.5 to one millimeter of uh, grease at the top. So I'm just gonna squeeze it in there like so. So you just gotta manipulate the boot to where it slides over and try not to displace the grease too much outside the boot. It's a little bit tricky to get this thing slid over without pushing a lot of the grease out, but use a little plastic pick tool. I don't think I'd use a screwdriver. Work it back and forth, there we go, finally I got it. So I'm just using this little plastic pick tool that I have, but you wouldn't want to use anything that sharp that would cut the boot because that defeats the purpose of what you're doing here. So now we got to get the wire tightened around here. So the wire is coiled up. I'm just uncoiling it, kind of straightening it out. And then now we have to wrap this around and it might be hard with slippery hands from the grease. So you want to dry your hands off and then we got to wrap it around a double loop and then twist it together. So I'm using two sets of needle nose pliers. I'm grabbing on opposing sides and pulling towards each other, and making sure I get the band where I want it on the boot, not underneath it. Pulling tight on both sides, then I'm gonna twist it once, twice, and then see how it's looking before I go much further. So I have it twisted quite a few times, and depending how tight you originally put the first coil in it might not be super tight so you can grab the whole twisted section and give it another 
little bit of a twist to basically bring the wires a little bit tighter against the ball joint like so give a little tug if you can't get any movement then you're probably good and now we're just going to clip off the excess there we go it looks just like it was from the factory I'm going to do one extra thing and I'm just going to push this down a little bit so this sharp edge is as far away from the boot as possible so I'm just going to push it down just a little bit there we go another thing that the direction shows is they show to get the wire ends on either side towards the front of the vehicle or towards the rear of the vehicle we're now noticing that because we have the end of the wire right here pointing directly towards the wheel that's where the boot is smushed down most and now it's making sense why they say to put it either to the forward side or the rear side because I think if the boot is resting up against that little nipple that you cut off of the wire over time maybe a little bit of a rubbing it's going to tear the boot there's a chance that maybe it's going to tear on Frank prematurely and if that happens we'll all hook him up and get it back over here and get a, a reboot kit for the top and we'll just reboot it for him but pay attention to that get the wire either towards the rear or towards the front not right where it's perpendicular to the wheel and the boot can rub on that wire end so we're back on the driver's side of Frank's truck and we're just going to reverse our procedure so the last thing that we got free was the end of the CV shaft so we have to slide that in first you just want to make sure you're gentle and you don't destroy this seal right here when you're going back in so support it and then slide the CV shaft through there and then we want to drop the lower ball joint back into the lower control arm now that it's supported underneath i really don't have to hold it that steady we're just adding grease that's supposed to go on the top of here and then a little is supposed to go in between the boot and the shaft of the ball joint so i'm just kind of forcing it in with my fingers so this is the application for this grease in the clear packet now that i got that on there i'll just keep some down pressure and get the nut started okay now that it's started i could let go I cinched this up and now I'm going to torque the upper ball joint castle nut to 80 foot pounds. There it is, 80 foot pounds. Now, the spindle of the upper ball joint has two holes going through it to give you a better chance of having the cotter pin line up with the slots in the castle nut. It looks like this hole is lining up nicely. I'm going to grab the provided cotter pin and I forgot to mention that this ball joint does come with the new castle nut so you slide it in there like so and then we're just going to bend it over and call it good it was almost perfectly lined up if you find that neither one is lined up perfectly just give it a little bit more of a turn tightening it don't loosen it There we go, that fits better. And then you just grab your pliers of choice and bend it over the top. And now your upper ball joint is securely fastened, torqued to the right spec to the upper control arm. I have the castle nut for the lower ball joint on and now I'm gonna torque that to 105 foot-pounds. So when you hit the 105 foot-pound torque spec, if you're lucky, which usually I'm not lucky, but this is one of the few times that I hit the torque spec and the one hole in the spindle of the lower ball joint is lining up with the castle nut. So I don't have to tighten it anymore to get the line up. So I'm sliding in a brand new cotter pin. Don't reuse cotter pins. It's not a good idea. Get a fresh one. And then just bend it back over like before. If you happen to use a pretty long cotter pin out of your kit, you could cut it down a little bit like I did with this one. So I'm going to trim a little bit off 
Tell your buddies to watch their eyes so they don't get blinded when it goes flying. Watch your eyes. All right, so now the lower ball joint is attached to the lower control arm and torqued to the proper spec of 105 foot pounds. So now we're gonna torque the castle nut for the outer tie rod to 67 foot pounds. Okay, 67 foot pounds. Now the outer tie rod spindle has two holes available for you to select from and hopefully one of them lines up and it looks like we're lucky. This one right here is lining up so I can get a cotter pin in here, no problem. Okay, now the outer tie rod is securely fastened to the knuckle of the ball joint with the fresh cotter pin. So now I'm just gonna grab the 35 millimeter axle nut and just put this on hand tight. In order to get this to the torque spec of 174 foot-pounds, we're gonna get the rotor on and the brakes attached, and then I'm gonna either use Frank or his friend Daniel, and they're gonna apply the brakes so I can get it up to the torque spec. Again, the other way you can do it if you're by yourself is you can put the tire on, lower the vehicle to the ground, putting weight on the tire, and then that will hold it still while you can get this to the torque spec of 174 foot-pounds. Now we're gonna get the rotor back on and then get the brake caliper back onto the knuckle. So I'm just gonna clean up the face of this first before I get the rotor back on. You could use brake cleaner or whatever cleaner you like. If you found that this was a little bit rusty, like if you're one of those poor guys that lives in the salt belts of the country, then maybe you wanna sand it down a little bit to get the corrosion off and then now I'm gonna put a little bit of anti-seize on the face of this to where the rotor will be less likely to get locked on here. I got a bunch of anti-seize all on the face of this hub. Now I'm gonna get the rotor in place. And then I'm gonna put some lug nuts on here to hold it against the face of the hub to where I'll have an easier time lining up the caliper with the brake pads onto the rotor. Okay. That's cinched up nice and tight. Now we're gonna get the rotor in place. Before I do that though, most likely you got some grease and other contaminants on the face of this rotor. So I'm gonna take a little bit of uh, brake cleaner and clean this off before putting the brake caliper back on. Just clean up both sides really good. Now that we have the rotor onto the face of the hub, we're gonna loosen our bailing wire and get the brake caliper back onto the rotor. I've got the brake caliper attached to the knuckle with the two 17 millimeter bolts, and now I'm gonna torque those bolts to 90 foot-pounds. Okay, the brake caliper is secured to the knuckle, torqued uh, 90 foot-pounds. So now it's time to torque this axle nut to 174 foot-pounds. Like I already mentioned, I'm gonna have one of the guys jump into the driver's seat, apply the brakes, which is gonna hold the rotor firm so I can get it up to the torque spec. Apply the brakes. Yep. And use good body mechanics. This is a high torque spec, so instead of pulling up, I'm using my body weight on the end of the torque wrench to push down, which gives me better leverage. There it is. 174 foot-pounds. One thing I just noticed is Frank is missing the little cage that goes over the nut and then you put the cotter pin in. Somebody who worked on it last, most likely the same guy who dented the crap out of his dust cap, forgot to put it back on. He just put a cotter pin back on. It's kind of nice to actually have that little cage over that, but he doesn't have one. So we just came back from the local Toyota dealer. They didn't have them in stock, so we had to order it. So hopefully the other side's gonna have one. For right now, we're just gonna stick the cotter pin in like this and call it good for now, because we can't get one. Without that washer that goes over the nut and then you capture it with the cotter pin, you can see that this nut, if it came loose, would be able to back out several turns, which wouldn't be good. With the actual washer, it will stop the nut from being able to turn hardly at all. That's why that piece is important. I'm trying to straighten this out a little bit with a small ball peen hammer. It's sort of working. It's 
it's a little better. You get it on here and then you just tap it with the plastic mallet. It's better than it was. So once it's fully seated, now you're done with this part. Now we're just gonna start reattaching these brackets that we took off. The first one I'm gonna put back on is this brake bracket. It's the 12 millimeter bolt. With this one, with the ABS sensor bolt, I'm sure there's a torque value for these, but I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm just gonna get them nice and snug and call it good. And that's good. I'm gonna get this ABS clamp back onto the knuckle. So just fit it around, compress it with your hands. Like I said, it's not a very strong clamp and then get your 10 millimeter nut started. It's not a big fastener, so I'm not gonna use all the leverage. I'm gonna choke up on this thing. Give it a couple turns, that's it. Now that's affixed. The last thing we got to do is we have to get this ABS sensor plugged back in. What I like to do is I like to put a little bit of grease on this O-ring so it'll make it easier to pull out the next time. So I'm going to grab my little grease gun and lubricate this O-ring a little bit. So I'm just going to squeeze a little bit of grease on here and rub it on the O-ring. And then we just insert it into the knuckle. And then we just got to grab the 10 millimeter bolt and get that in there. There's a torque spec for this, but I really don't care what it is. I'm just gonna get it snug because all it's holding is this light little sensor. Just get it to where the bolt's not gonna come loose. And then finally, the plastic clip, plug that back into this brake bracket. So everything's back on. The last thing we gotta do is get the tire on. This is a technique that I've showed in other videos. If you don't have a big hydraulic lift and you're doing this on the ground, I put my forearms against my legs and then I kind of lift up with my legs and with my arms and then just get the wheel on. So instead of like leaning over and picking it up standing, if you get on a solid base on the ground, you can get it up a lot easier and not strain your back. And we're just going to get all the lug nuts on and then once we're done, we're going to drop it to the ground and we're going to torque all these lug nuts to 85 foot pounds. So you see I have the wire end clipped right here. This direction's towards the tire. The boot is kind of resting right on that little wire end. Over time that could wear a hole in it, which is unfortunate. Don't do what I did. Put the end of the wire either towards the front here or get the wire end towards the rear. We're on the passenger side right now. So you might be thinking, well, I don't want to buy a ball joint kit and all the adapters. That's a lot of money. Luckily, there's a lot of auto parts stores that rent tools for free, like AutoZone and O'Reilly's. And I know for a fact that they will rent ball joint kits like this. The question is whether or not they will actually have the needed cups to make it work. Let me give you some dimensions of the cups that I used for this job. We'll start off with this upper cup that is the OTC 538591. It's approximately 76 millimeters long. The outer diameter is 39 millimeters. This inner diameter that interfaces with the top of the ball joint, it slides on and it actually has this little beveled edge that fits into this beveled edge. That inner diameter is about 26 millimeters. Now this side is just interfacing with the driving pin of the ball joint press. It's this end right here that's mating up with that. This pin was actually not part of the kit I bought. I bought it separately. The pin that I'm talking about is in this diagram right here and it's part number 7248. And basically it's just a shorter pin. This is the normal pin that came with the kit and you can see that it's longer than this one by quite a bit. And I think the reason for that is that gives you some extra room to get all the cups in position onto the knuckle so you can press the ball joint out and press it back in. It's just giving you more room to work with. This bottom cup, which is part number 38354, it's approximately 63 millimeters long and it's got an inner diameter of about 51 millimeters. On this side, this just interfaces with the press like so. 
this little beveled lip fits into the inner diameter of this and it kind of grabs it and holds it in position. Now for the pressing in of the new ball joint, the receiving cup is part number 38355A as an atom. It's got an approximate length of 92 millimeters and the inner diameter is about 45 millimeters. It also has this beveled end that interfaces with the ball joint press like so. Finally, you have this part right here and the part number for that is 313968 and that's this doohickey right here. It's got a width of about 36 millimeters. It's about 25 millimeters long and this sucker goes in like so. It fits in to the inner diameter of the C-press and this is what is driving against the bottom of the ball joint as you press it into position. Now if you didn't have something like this, maybe you can just use a, a socket or whatever you can figure out, whatever you can MacGyver. So I wanted to give you some of the measurements of these specialty cups that I bought for this job. So when you go to the auto parts store, you can take a look, bring a caliper tool or maybe just a ruler and see what the kit comes with and whether or not you're going to have everything you need before you leave the store. All right, we're all done with this job. Like usual, doing something for the first time, we learned a few things. And one of the things that we learned was this ball joint kit is it actually came with instructions which is pretty rare because normally there's no instructions with the parts you get from Toyota but this happens to come with instructions and it does say for that wire to try to get it to the side a little bit but we noticed that now that the truck is on its wheels the boot is not really rubbing up against that wire as much as it was before do what we suggested either get the wire ends towards the rear of the truck or towards the front of the truck well away from the boot so there's no chance it's gonna tear on you down the road. People have successfully removed the ball joints and reinstalled them while the knuckle is still on the vehicle. It can be done, but from my personal experience doing lifts and doing this job today is that it is really worth the time to take the knuckle completely off the vehicle, get it on your workbench and then do the pressing out and back in of the ball joint. It's just easier. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Frank and his buddy Daniel. We'll be back with more videos. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye-bye. Timmy! Timmy!